This conference uh, will lunch. now be recorded. Okay, thanks to lunch. Um, so, welcome everyone to today's webinar. Hope you are all well. Um, as Lange has mentioned, um, we'll I'll be presenting Risk of Bias 2.0 today. Um, I thought that it would be a good way uh, or good um, webinar way to present a webinar if this could be a bit more of a practical session, which um, will occur later on um, after I present some of the theory aspects of Risk of Bias 2.0. And I also felt that um, by doing a risk of bias assessment, showing you how to do one and with some of you um, partaking in it, it, it might make it a bit more um, easier to understand and less daunting once you actually do embark on um, conducting your systematic reviews um, and including the risk of bias 2.0 tool. So before I get started, um, I think it would be good to for us to um, acknowledge or for me to acknowledge um, the core group and contributors that um, actually helped um, develop Risk of Bias 2.0. Um, and so um, thank you to, to Julian Higgins that shared some of his slides with us uh, for me to use. So. Um, before we get started in, in the details, um, usually with steps of a caution review, um, we would have these 10 steps, or a good systematic review would generally consist of, of these um, 10 broad steps. And as we know, um, assessing um, studies for risk of bias um, would fall under step number seven after we've collected the data. And then briefly, just some learning objectives before we um, go on. Um, so this will, like I said, be brief introduction to risk of bias 2.0. We'll identify bias within randomized control trials and then use the tool um, to, ass to assess a paper that um, was shared with all of you um, and assess the risk of bias for that particular paper. So for some of you, risk of bias or bias itself, the term um, may not, may be a bit of a newish concept. I thought I'd just uh, go over some some of the concepts to um, uh, to make it a bit more understandable. So we define bias as systematic error or deviation from the truth. And so that the results of the study um, do not provide a good estimate of the true effects of the experimental intervention. So there are two considerations that affect whether findings of a study can be applied. And one is external validity or the applicability of the study to the situation in which it is um, to be applied. And then the second is internal validity or while the study estimates um, the effect it is trying to measure. And our definition of bias targets internal validity. So if the study is affected by bias, the results may be misleading and not doing a clear job of telling the truth about the real effect of the experiment intervention compared with the comparator. And we can really know for sure whether a result is biased, but we can look at the methods used by the study at what happened during the study and at how the data were analyzed and reported to see if the study has features that put the result at risk of bias. And then it is also important to know that bias is not the same as low quality of study conduct. So quality means did they do the best they could do and bias would mean do I believe result. So these terms are often used interchangeably, but we are more interested in the believability of the results than criticizing the efforts made by the study authors. 
And even a well-conducted study can be at risk of bias. For example, in studies where blinding is impossible, um, and this would be an example where you're looking at swimming versus running as an exercise, where it's difficult to blind participants or surgical trials where um, the surgeon can't be blinded. In these cases, we cannot criticize the authors, but we should still acknowledge um, that there is a possibility that the study results may be affected by participants' awareness of the intervention. And similarly, not all methodological flaws are relevant to bias. So for example, failure to perform a sample size calculation or to obtain ethical approval are important markers of study quality, but they do not have direct implications for bias. And then we move on to bias is also not the same as um, the poor quality of reporting. So studies really report the methods used in um, an exhaustive um, detail and may often have used rigorous methods, even if they are not described in the published paper. And the details of methods reporting um, is improving, um, but you would find that with, with older studies or older RCTs um, that these um, details may not be present. And bias is also not the same as imprecision. So imprecision refers to random error. And each time we take a sample and measure outcomes, we will get natural variations from um, the true values in the whole population. So the smaller the sample, the more variability we will get. And the imprecision that results from high variability is reflected in the confidence interval around the result we present. So these are just some points that um, we need to remember. And Cochrane has adopted the notion of risk of bias as the way to think about bias in the results of the included studies. So whether we should believe the results, um, we can really know for sure whether the result is biased um, again um, and again, uh, but we can also look at the methods used by the study. And we look at what happened during the study um, and how things were analyzed. And then it's also important to note that risk of bias is a property of a result. So when we talk about risk of bias, it is in relation to an estimate of the effect of an intervention. So we avoid talking about risk of bias in the study as a whole because different outcomes examined in the study might have different risks of bias. Um, an example of this is that uh, for your system, for a systematic review, you may be interested in various outcomes such as pain, anxiety, and stress. But for the different outcomes that I've mentioned, there may be different um, risks of bias, um, either in the way in which um, those outcomes were measured, or um, just um, the, the general general domains or, or, or um, phases of the of the trial in which um, risk of bias or bias may occur, may differ for the various um, outcomes. And then um, rather than a score sheet or checklist, um, we adopt a domain-based approach when assessing risk of bias. So review authors are required to assess each study against the main um, bias-related concerns affecting um, the results of studies and providing as much detail as possible and citing evidence um, directly from directly from the trial reports or any sources um, um, uh, linked to the trial to support the assessment. Uh, they then summarize these to reach an overall um, judgment on, on the risk of um, bias risk of bias result. So over years, basically, uh, just a very broad overview um, the area, um, of risk of bias. So on the list, on the very far left, are all the domains of risk of bias, which you can see differs from risk of, um, of risk of bias. Um, the first tool that we used for risk of bias, and in the middle column, um, you will see that there are signaling questions that need to be answered for the respective domains. And then you also have on the far right column um, the answers or potential answers, which are either yes, potentially yes, potentially no, no. 
or there, it will be no information or not enough information. And generally, yes, potentially yes is considered um, one answer and potentially no and no is considered um, one answer. And at the very end, the last row, one ends up with an overall bias judgment, which will either be low, high, or of some concern. And do note that this can be overturned if there's enough information and reason to justify um, your decision. So the process of implementing risk of bias 2 is as follows. We first, we need to determine which results we want to assess. So like I said, um, you may choose to assess pain or choose to assess anxiety um, or stress. And for each of the key syntheses in the review, we firstly identify which studies potentially contribute to it. So in box one, you'll see that we identify the result from each study that we would like to use in the syntheses. And then um, we discuss the effect of interest, which happens later on in the session. Um, we also look at number three for the transparency. Um, and this is useful to note which sources um, we, we gather information from. So was it journal articles, protocols, um, trial, trial registry entries or correspondence with um, trial investigators. Um, and these are used to inform the risk of bias assessment. And then from box four, five and six, um, the risk of bias tool includes questions to answer judgments to make for each bias domain and a judgment to make an overall, um, as we shall see later. And then finally, we need to use the risk of bias judgments to draw our conclusions from the syntheses. For example, we might use the judgments to stratify studies or to restrict attention to those at lower risk of bias. So with this bit, signaling questions and judgments, I guess within each domain, risk of bias includes um, signaling questions and these are reasonably factual questions about what was done or what happened in the trial, although some of them do require some judgments and the possible answers to these questions, like I mentioned, would be yes, probably yes, um, et cetera. And um, a nice part of this tool is that it um, incorporates algorithms so that once the signaling questions have been answered, risk of bias judgments are suggested. So the user will then need to decide whether to agree with these or override them. And the algorithms aim to propose a high risk of bias judgment only if the problem in the domain are such that the result as a whole should be deemed to be at high risk of bias. In other words, a high risk of bias in any one domain is sufficient to determine the overall risk of bias. And again, this rule can be overridden. And here we see an example um, of suggested overall risk of bias judgments um, in this illustration. So to get a low risk of bias, we need to have a low um, risk of bias in all domains, as you can see in the very top row. And if there's a mixture of low and some concern, then the result is at some concern of, um, of um, uh, bias. And if only one um, domain is at high risk of bias, as you can see in the third one, where domain three is at high risk of bias, then the result is at high risk of bias overall as you can see at the very end. And then sometimes you may also find that there are mixtures of several domains that have some concern and you, may, you might um, judge the accumulation of concerns as efficient in, enough to, to motivate for um, high risk of bias. Okay, and then over here, um, you may have seen this um, website. So this is risk of bias point, uh, um, dot info, um, And this is where all the tools and the resources of um, risk of bias um, can be found. And these are updated um, every couple of months as they do develop the tool further. So before we um, go into any of the exercises and the domains that follow, um, over here we can see a depiction of the basic architecture of a randomized trial. Um, different kinds of biases um, can arise throughout 
um, both the conduct of a trial and the dissemination of its results. In the key domains we are looking for in risk of biases is to at different stages during the trial and there are particular features we are looking for to minimize risk of bias. So these stages are um, the process of randomizing participants into intervention groups, um, so during the trial, um, whether there were deviations from the planned intervention, um, and then the possibility that participants also drop out or do not have um, outcome data measured for some or whatever other reason, um, methods of measuring the endpoints or the outcomes of participants, and then also the reporting of results. So to start off with, we'll touch on briefly um, bias arising from the randomization process. And the first stage of a trial after recruitment of participants is the random allocation of experimental and compared interventions to the participants. And a well-implemented randomization prevents prognostic factors from influencing which intervention is allocated to who. And if randomization is not undertaken properly, we end up with systematic differences between baseline characteristics um, of the groups that are compared, which can affect the results of the trial. So there are two issues that we need to consider at this point, and this is generating uh, a random sequence of allocations and also concealing this sequence. And the first issue is generating the sequence used to allocate people into groups. So we want to we want this to be a random sequence, um, allocating participants to interventions based on a random sequence also avoids, like I said, systematic differences. Um, and it's important that it offers or it offers the only way of balancing both prognostic factors we know about and those that we do not know about. And then for this to be considered adequate um, sequence, the sequence should be truly random and unpredictable. Um, simple random sequences can be generated either by computers or using old fashioned methods like coin tossing. Um, and then we also consider minimization to be um, uh, fine in relation to sequence generation, although it is not totally random in include uh, and it includes a random element. Um, and then also to note that most trials described as randomized should have used a random allocation concealment um, sequence. Um, and you'd need to look into the methods to see if this is actually the case, because sometimes it's not. They, they'll say it's randomized, but it's not actually uh, a randomized um, trial. So um, methods that are known are quasi-random, such as alternating allocation or allocation based on seemingly irrelevant detail. Um, and these would include date of birth, day of visit, ID, et cetera. And then when we go to allocation consumment, and this is important to so to note that um, it shouldn't be um, confused with blinding, but they are, and, and they are not the same. Allocation concealment occurs at the start of the trial and before participants are allocated to the group or receive any intervention as they are being enrolled into the study. So allocation concealment is almost um, always possible even in studies where blinding is impossible. And ad um, ad adequate concealment um, of the allocation sequence is anything that ensures that um, there's um, or that the unpredictable nature of the random sequence has been protected and cannot be known up until the end or the point of allocation. So a good example um, includes um, central randomization, and like I said, computers used um, by computers or a separate office not involved in the recruitment. And then allocation concealment is inadequate if sequence is in any way known in advance or if it can be predicted. 
and this is sometimes the last allocation in a block um, which can be predicted by society personnel which can undermine random allocation so those are just some um, some things to look out for and as you can see on the slide there are some also listed then there's also um, baseline imbalances to consider um, and this was one of the most frequently added items in the original um, risk of bias tool. So baseline imbalance is considered in risk of bias two because many child have not reported randomization methods in sufficient detail to assess whether um, there were or there was a random allocation sequence and allocation um, sequence concealment. So in the absence of good information about um, randomization methods, we can see that there are some clues um, which can sometimes be found from the observed baseline characteristics of participants in the different intervention groups. And imbalances in baseline variables will always arise due to chance, so that's important to remember. And um, these chance imbalances, imbalances are not evidence of a problem and should not be used to reach judgment that a study is at high risk of bias. So the first two questions, um, as you can see with the signaling questions, one of the as our first example, um, they are about the main two processes, so generating a truly random sequence and concealing um, the sequence until participants are irreversibly enrolled into the trial. And it's important to note that the wording of the third question it is not asking whether there was baseline imbalance. Um, it is asking whether there was substantial imbalance that provides evidence that the randomization process was problematic. So many users do interpret or misinterpret this question. And in most cases, the answer will be no or probably no. And just to illustrate the algorithm that I was mentioning in domain one, and this is um, similar in all the other domains. So um, the algorithm is for mapping answers to signaling questions to judgments. And they are not always drawn chronic, um, chronologically according to question. Instead, um, they are drawn as efficiently as possible. So here we start off with whether the allocation sequence was concealed. And if it wasn't, then the result immediately is um, high risk of bias. Um, and if it was, then the sequence was random and there was no substantial balance as a baseline, then is, the result will lead you to a low risk of bias. And then really major imbalances at baseline imply that the randomization was not done properly despite our um, impression from the methods. And then we would have some concerns or, or sometimes possibly worse. We might also have some concerns if the underlying sequence was not random, even if the sequence was concealed. Um, we wouldn't expect to be in the situation very often. And then quite often we don't have enough information to judge whether there was allocation concealment, then we would not be able to um, uh, say with confidence that there is low risk of bias. But we can use information at baseline to describe whether randomization methods look problematic. And in this case, it might be um, high risk of bias or of, no or, or of some concern. So um, as we get into the activity-based portion of this webinar, um, you have seen that we circulated links to the um, safety and efficacy of those vaccine against COVID-19. And this is the Johnson & Johnson um, study or child um, that's, um, that was conducted. And we basically, we were looking if, if we hypothetically were to this is and we had our PICO, then our population of interest would um, be adult, adults um, 18 years and older, and our intervention would be administration of a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, either as a single or multiple dose regimen. Our comparator would be placebo, and our outcome of interest, as I mentioned, um, you can have multiple outcomes of 
of interest for this particular one we're specifically looking at efficacy so incidence of COVID-19 diagnosis um, and then other um, outcomes of interest could also be safety and um, those kind of things but specifically for this example and for this webinar we'll look at efficacy so like I said we'll focus on one outcome and specific result For the first domain, we'll, we will look at assessing risk of bias arising from the randomization process. And at this stage, um, people can either put it into the chat or they can unmute themselves. Um, for those that have um, done the, the bit of homework, I guess. Um, and for the first question we ask is um, under domain one was the allocation sequence random? So I'm not sure who read the paper or um, maybe uh, did the risk of bias beforehand. But if there are answers, you can um, put them through the chat. or you can unmute yourself. Okay, so answer coming through and saying, yes, it was. Okay, so under domain one, um, there was um, what we would normally do, you would quote something and uh, part of the text and put it under the elaboration. Um, and as you can see over here, what I did is I took a screenshot. And so I looked at the main paper and we can see over here that they do say that it was randomized, it was double blind, placebo controlled, phase three. Um, and under procedures, they also say randomization was conducted um, and they provide some detail over there. And then also under their, um, the, FDA um, submission um, that has some details of the randomization process that, that took place under 6.3 um, and they do refer in the main paper to this. And then likewise with 1.2 was the allocation sequence concealed until participants were enrolled and assigned to the intervention and, and at the same time under that um, screenshot we see that the answer is yes. Okay, thanks Trump Pierre for sending through your answers. Um, um, as we go by and continue, please. <laughs> uh, so under 1.3, did baseline differences between intervention groups suggest a problem with the randomization process? And again, we go th through the various sources of, of um, the study. Um, and over here again, I found this under table one in the main um, article or publication. And when you skim through it, it doesn't look like there's anything of concern that would suggest any um, imbalances. It looked quite evenly spread. And also under the FDA um, submission. So over here you would say no, and that is the favorable answer. So as you can see over here, things that are in green are usually the favorable answer and would lead you to a low risk of bias. So if you had to follow the algorithm that, that I showed previously, um, your eventual score would um, lead you to a low risk of bias. So in the next domain, which is the second domain, we look at deviations from the intended intervention. And here's an infographic. So um, it provides, um, or it's meant to, it's, it shows that, that in a trial, you, you would be someone that's providing an intervention, meaning that they do something that is intended. And then you have your participant that either receives something or they are, they are required to do something that is intended. So there is an interaction between um, these two of the person administering and the person receiving. Um, and so the question is, how may we deviate from this? So 
in box one, we see additional interventions given. The person administering um, administering the intervention, like the task staff, would be providing additional interventions um, that are inconsistent with the trial protocol. So for example, um, if you went for your um, SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, um, you you get your jab from the from the um, nurse or from the healthcare professional, and then they say to you, okay, you can go to raves, you can go to parties, you can go to major big events, gatherings, et cetera, and get exposed, um, potentially get exposed to the virus. So that would be considered as additional interventions given, right? So it's not following the actual protocol. So it's non-protocol interventions that actually affect the outcome of interest and can lead to bias in estimated intervention effects. Um, so they specifically potential non-protocol interventions um, in the review protocol. And then under box two, failure to implement as intended, um, it may be that you know the vaccine is just not given or a certain intervention or certain form of re rehabilitation is just not given. And this would be the failure of the staff to actually implement according to the protocol intervention. And then under box three, you have um, non-adherence to the assigned intervention and um, by the TART participants. So it may be that, you know, um, there's a, it's a drug intervention and the participant just chooses not to take the, the, the drug or the medication at all, or the physiotherapist or, or um, therapist gave the participant um, certain exercises or um, things to do and the participant just doesn't do it. And then the next bit is the role of blinding. So over here, um, blinding our participants and purpose should prevent knowledge of intervention assignment from um, influencing. Um, and we look at contamination. So this is where um, they should prevent switches in intervention of participants who are intended to receive um, one or the other um, either intervention or you would have also non-adherence by child participants, um, which, which may also occur. Um, just seeing if there's anything else I need to add to this. Okay, we'll talk a bit further on blinding later. Okay, this is a bit that tends to stump people at times. Um, and that is estimating the effect of assignment to intervention. So in Cochrane reviews, we usually assess the effect of assignment to intervention, and um, we are interested in the um, um, intention to cheat um, uh, or ITT um, analysis, and that's normally important to us. So it's um, the analysis or analyzing participants in the intervention group to which they were randomized regardless of the intervention received. Um, and this is where we include all randomized participants in the analysis and measure outcome data on all participants. Um, and then you will find that there are um, occasions where studies also provide a per protocol effect and um, there are systematic views or, or per protocol effect would be important, but it's but it's usually of importance to to um, participants or patients where they actually want to see whether whether something works or doesn't work for them. Um, but for systematic reviews, we normally be interested in the ID. And the guidance document that that I shared um, with you goes into a lot more detail on um, the differences and how they are important to in different situations when looking at per protocol effect and ITT. So here again, we have the questions for um, domain two. And as you can see over here, um, under 2.1 and 2.2, if you answer no for both of these um, questions, immediately there's a low risk of bias at which stage you then go over to question 2.6 and 2.7. And if um, 
this is to is make the fix i mean if it's yes immediately it's a low risk of, of bias um, and then there's all the various other ways in which you achieve low risk some concern and high risk of bias and then there's also some criteria for the domains over here at the bottom with some explanation okay so we go on to the next exercise and that is um bias due to deviations from the intended intervention and we specifically like i said we, we are interested in the effect of assignment to intervention so generally um itt and we have our signaling questions and the first one asks um were participants aware of the assigned intervention during the trial um and again if you'd like to unmute or like to put it in the chat um you can let me know what your answers were thanks sean pierce i have been over there and this is what i found so i looked at the study i looked at the fda submission i also went to the clinical trials um that gov um site where they've registered the the trial and they also do say that masking occurred it was quadruple so it was participant care provider investigator and outcome assessor and then 2.2 according to the algorithm in um, the risk of bias to guidance document um it also seems like blinding um, seems to be implemented and successful so work cares and people delivering the intervention away of participants assigned in, um, intervention during the trial and um so correct that is um no so if you answer no for both of these, which look favorable, as you can see over there, then immediately you would skip 2.3, 2.4, and 2.5, right? And at this stage, you then go to 2.6, where they ask, was an appropriate analysis used to estimate the effect of assignment to intervention? And um, in the study itself, they do say that a per protocol analysis was performed on efficacy outcomes as planned in the trial protocol. So they did mention in the trial protocol that they do a per protocol analysis. Um, but for systematic review purposes and for risk of bias, um, we would we would indicate this as being um, potentially no or no, right? So it wasn't appropriate. Um, and then under 2.7 because we answered no we'd have to go on to 2.7 the question is was the potential for substantial impact on the result of failure to analyze participants in the group to which they were randomized and we say that there was no substantial impact of failure to analyze participants um And so we do say no, which is a favorable answer under 2.7. And then when you follow the algorithm, you'd you'd eventually end up with um, it being of some concern for this particular outcome. But if you had to follow the algorithm and if you were, lo were to look at safety outcomes, such as serious adverse events and those kind of things, and do the same um, assessment, then you would probably find that um, your your assessment would lead you um, to to um, a low concern of um, risk of bias for safety. So moving on to the next bit, there's risk of bias um, um, for missing outcome data. So missing measurements of outcome, for example, due to dropout during the study may also lead to bias intervention effect estimates. Um, so it's how much is too much missing outcome data, one, might, one may ask, and there's no sensible threshold um, for too small enough in relation to um, proportion of missing outcome data. 
and how do we know whether there is bias? Um, unfortunately, it's not always possible to examine directly um, whether missingness in the outcomes depend on its true value. Um, the potential impact of missing data on estimated intervention effects also depends on um, the number of participants with missing data, the type of outcome, so was it continuous or dichotomous or time to event. So those are also things that one journey also needs to um, consider. And then I also have some other reasons for missing outcomes all listed over here. And then what would um, make it low risk of bias and high risk of bias? So outcome data that are available for all or nearly all participants, that would be low risk of bias. Um, if there's evidence for um, uh, that, that the result is not biased by missing outcome data, for example, using sensitivity analysis, and if missingness in the outcome does not depend on its true value, and things that are of high risk is missingness in outcomes that depend on its true value. But again, this, this is um, quite a big chunk of the guidance document where they're going to a lot of detail on defining missingness and the true values and it this in itself can probably take an hour of 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 a webinar so we won't delve too deep into this and then we when we look at the algorithm again we see that um for domain number three the outcome data for all participants um if we rate it as yes so we have outcome for all participants immediately it gets a low risk of bias but if no then there are various questions again that we need to um, ask and answer so bias due to missing outcome data the first one is were, um, were data for this outcome available for all or nearly all participants randomized um, and as a comment, we know that there were 44,325 participants randomized, um, and there were um, 43,783 that received the vaccine or placebo. And then as the protocol um, population included um, 39,321, and this comes out of the results section of the paper itself, of the main publication. So for efficacy, um, we do not have data for all or nearly all participants um, for efficacy, so we only have 89%. So for this, our signaling question would be no, which means that we move over to 3.2, is, is the evidence that the result was not biased by missing outcome data? And for this, um, we also say there's no evidence that the result is biased. Um, and then we also know that the patients were excluded because some violated the protocol or um, were this positive for SARS-CoV-2 at the time of vaccination and the bias had been taken into account in domain two. So for this, we say that um, missing, missingness was considered unrelated to the true value of the outcome. So we'd also say no for 3.3. And again, we'd skip 3.4 because we'd said no. Um, and then according to the algorithm, it would lead us to a low um, risk of bias for this particular outcome. Before I move on, are there any questions at this stage? Ask questions in the chat or unmute yourself. Okay, so I'm going to move on. Um, the next bit is bias in uh, measurement of outcome. So bias may also arise from systematic difference in the way the outcome of interest is measured or detected. Um, and this is a source of bias can, or the source of bias can be minimized by blinding outcome assessors, 
intervention assignment. So here we have various issues um, we should consider, and it perhaps goes without saying that um, the measurement method should always be appropriate. We'd expect this to be the case for pre-specified outcomes in a randomized trial. Um, however, we need to look at our situations where, where methods um, just aren't capable of giving us reliable information, particularly for um, adverse outcomes that are collected spontaneously. It's also important that um, how the outcomes are measured or ascertained, um, and if they are ascertained um, in the same manner or the same way in the two groups. Again, most trials ensure that this is the case, but sometimes there are more opportunities to answer outcomes in one group than the other. And this can also lead to overestimating or overestimation um, in one group compared to another, especially, like I said, if there's um, adverse events that occur. And the main issues we consider in this domain are who is assessing the outcome, whether the outcome assessor is aware of the intervention assignment, um, so a form of blinding, and um, the nature of the outcome. So if possible, outcome assessment should be made blinded, or assessors should be made blinded to the intervention assignment. And if an outcome assessor knows which group a participant is in, they may change the way they measure the outcome. And then we also mustn't forget that participants may also be outcome assessors. So if someone knows they are taking a placebo, they may report different results, um, particularly for subjective outcomes such as pain or quality of life. So those are things that we need to keep in mind. And we also need to be careful at who's blinded and um, judge whether you think that blinding was successful. And remember that blinding outcome assessment may be feasible even where blinding of participants and care providers is not. Okay, so what would what would give us low risk of bias and high risk of bias? So blinding implemented and unlikely that the blinding could have been broken. So those are things that we need to consider. Um, if there's no blinding, but measurement is unlikely to be influenced by knowledge of the intervention assignment. Um, and then something that would give us high risk is no blinding or broken blinding and measurement that is likely to be influenced. As you can see over here with four point with um, domain four, it's quite a complicated um, algorithm that they follow. And with 4.1, um, they ask method of measuring the outcome. Was it inappropriate? And if yes, which is not always likely that it will occur, but if yes, then immediately it's a high risk of bias. And if no, then you would follow the various other signaling questions on the algorithm. And then going back to the paper, we ask, um, was the method of measuring the outcome inappropriate? Um, and I said that it wasn't, which means I go to the next bit. Could measurement or ascertainment of the outcome have um, differed between the intervention groups? And I also said that the measurement or the ascertainment um, probably does not differ between the groups. Um, was so we know that the outcome assessors were blinded, and then according to the algorithm, um, you would um, you do not answer um, 4.4 and 4.5, um, and you would then get some a low risk um, outcome or low, low risk of, of bias for confirmed symptomatic COVID-19. And then bias in selection of reported results. Um, once the trial has been completed, there's still one further source, which is um, reported results. And when reporting um, a trial, an author can introduce a form of bias by deliberately reporting only the positive or statistically significant outcomes. And this we call uh, cherry picking. Um, they may also modify the planned analysis to make the results more positive or significant. Um, 
and again, we would need to have access to protocols, to clinical trial registrations, so that we can compare what they said they do and what they've actually have done. And it's also important to look at the clinical trial registration and the protocols that um, that are around to the date um, at which um, they were released and um, edited um, to make sure that those dates um, were before the actual um, study um, publication. Um, it can occur sometimes that they that they change um, uh, things on the last second to make it look as if it's corresponding. Okay, I'm going to go over this. Okay, and then it's just important to note that um, certain outcomes may use multiple scales. Um, to, to measure, for example, um, stress or anxiety, and there might also be multiple definitions or criteria, criteria for an event occurring and multiple time points that are used. So those are things that need to um, be looked at um, for reporting of results. Um, did you see if there's anything more of a year that needs to be added? That should be fine. And again, like I said, it's um, ideally we want to have pre-specified analysis plans. So again, look at um, date stamped um, before. Um, look at the trial protocols. Um, if you don't have, especially with the older studies, you may not have protocols and trials that are registered. So then you would also want to compare methods with results, and so um, try your best to. To contact authors and see if you can get information from them um, and document it on, on your risk of bias assessment. Okay, and as I've indicated um, for reporting of results, please specify trial analysis plans, if available, would lead you to low risk of bias. Um, and then if, they, if you if you struggle, if, they, if there's just not enough um, evidence out there, or there's a strong hint, um, then you'd likely end up with high risk of bias for this particular domain. And with this domain, there's only three questions over here. And again, when we look at the the Johnson and Johnson um, paper. We know that they did um, provide a protocol, they provided a statistical analysis plan, um, a, there was a trial registry, and there was also an FDA briefing document, which, um, which we were able to access to um, gain um, outcomes data and to um, assess risk of bias. And if we look at 5.2 and 5.3, um, the results were not selected from multiple outcomes, measurements, or um, analysis of the data. Um, so they were they were analyzed according to a pre-specified plan, um, which you would see in 5.1. So it was a pre-specified plan, and so we can then say that this is low um, risk of of um, bias for this particular outcome. Before I end off, I just want to indicate that there's also an Excel document or tool that you can use to use um, when assessing risk of bias, which is on the website. And over here, this is an example that I have over here. You can tick off um, where you've um, accessed the information for, for risk of bias for your particular study. So if you child protocol, this is the next plan, you could copy literature, et cetera. We have various domains one to five and the overall bias for which you answer questions. There's those same questions I've, I've gone through now. And over here, as you can see in this example with 5.1, we would say that there was no information, 5.2, no information, 5.3, um, um, yes or yes. And then if you click on the algorithm at the bottom, um, you see algorithm results. Um, it then generates the risk of bias for you, which it then gives you as high risk of bias. Okay, the rest is pretty straightforward stuff that we usually use in um, 
let's go by one. So I will end over there. Um, there is a more detailed um, workshop uh, that, that Cochrane Training has provided, um, which is also online, and I can share that afterwards. Um, Solange, over to you. And if there are any questions, please feel free to ask. Thanks so much, um, Amir. Um, so we have a, a few minutes. So if there are any other questions, this is the moment to ask them. Um, there's a comment about the evaluation link not working. So let me just try that again. I had a similar um, issue last week. And sometimes if you, you need to just make sure that you don't add the full stop at the very bottom. So at the very end. So the S Y ah, nine that was don't. It. Yeah, delete the, the full stop and then that should work. Let me just see if I can resend it without the full stop. Um, and then, I don't know why it copies with the full stop though. Okay, there's a question I'm here from Jean-Pierre about um, to explain the reason for putting no to 2.6. Um, let me go back. Two point six. I'm scrolling back on my side of here. So the question for 2.6 was, was an appropriate analysis plan used to estimate the effect of the intervention? Oh yeah, so the reason why we say, and, and that is something that that a couple of us that have discussed with Scott Bias 2.0 have had questions about in the past. Um, and the reason why we say no to that is because they, they for, for, for efficacy, they use a per protocol analysis and for systematic reviews, um, we generally are interested in intention to cheat. Um, and because we use per protocol, we said that it, um, that it was not appropriate. Um, but then again, when you look at the same study and you look at how they've reported on safety data, they use an intention to cheat analysis. And if we were to do an assessment on safety using 2.6, we would then say, yes, that um, that was an appropriate analysis. Um, so that can be confusing, um, but for um, for us, we, we, are, we want to see that they've actually used intention to treat analysis. Thanks, Amir. Jean-Pierre, I hope Sorry. that's clear. Um, yes. I'm going to. Uh, okay. I'm sharing a a link to a very very comprehensive um, risk of bias 2.0 training. And like I said, uh, a training like this usually goes over about three days. Um, and there are some YouTube links from Cochrane Training where um, they've broken it up into almost hour long sessions per domain. So they've actually run it, they ran it last year over, I think about um, close to eight sessions where they've had an introductory for one hour or more than one hour actually. Um, and then following that every couple of weeks, they, they'd actually focused on every single domain, um, which makes it a lot more easier to follow, which I obviously couldn't do in, in one hour. So that's why I made this a more practical session. Thanks, Amir. That's great. There's a, I mean, we're out of time. Um, just a quick maybe response to Marta I was asking if there is an Excel sheet similar to the one for individual randomized trials specific for cluster trials. Um, I am not too sure. I'd have to look on the, on the, on okay. the website. Yeah. So perhaps we can have a look at that and we can send any additional um, resources to you guys when we send um, the copy of the slides and the copy of the 
the presentation. Yeah, that will be great. And I've shared the web link to the scope bias. Okay. Great. Thanks, everyone. And if you have additional questions, please feel free to email us as well, uh, and we'll try to respond and assist as best we can. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Amir, for facilitating and uh, presenting today. Thank you very much. Bye. It was a pleasure. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.